it's time for another celeb interview and in the celebration of the documentary feature Game Master, which is available for free streaming for Amazon Prime members and it's also available on VOD platforms. I'm here talking with the director of this film, Charles Murs, and Hello. one of its executive producers, Jimmy Wen. How you doing, guys? Woo! Doing all right. <laughs> doing all right. great. Congratulations on the documentary, which I watched recently. Um, so let's start with you, Charles. Uh, of all the subject matters out there that one can do a documentary feature on, why did you choose to own in on the tabletop gaming industry? Well, you know, a couple of reasons. One, one is that a documentary on this subject, or at least um, one that I thought was all encompassing or could really unlock the potential of the subject had not been done yet. There's a handful of, you know, pieces out there that touch on the subject, but I just, you know, one that really dives in didn't exist. So that's one reason that we wanted to do it. Another reason is that we just straight up love board games, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's how the, the genesis of this came about is just, it didn't start from what can we make a movie about that doesn't exist that would be interesting. It was what is interesting to us, let's, you know, get into that. And the movie, almost came second or third after in a line of, you know, things that we loved about board games. And Jimmy, what is it about this project that, that made you want to be involved as a producer? Well, uh, me and Charles were playing a lot of board games together at the time, and we were going to conventions. And we were, initially, we started um, competing in Settlers and Catan tournaments. And after doing that for like about a year, we started to spread out and play other games. And what was great is like, we just discovered so many new games pretty quickly. I mean, you spend about four days at a con if you're there every day. And we used to get a room at the Hilton where the con was at and just like sleep there and then just play all day, all night. So you come across a lot of really interesting people. And eventually we started to find um, like independent designers who were selling their own games at these conventions. And so we, I met this one particular guy who, you know, sold me his game. He gave me a sales pitch. He was very like romantic about it. And I just like kind of really dug that experience of just hearing this guy like talk about the story behind this game. And so I had pitched it to Charles and I'm like, what do you think about this as a movie? You know, we had kind of batted it around for a little bit and initially started off as a joke because I got, I just got finished with Barista. And if you could imagine like the timeline, it's like Barista was finished. I, I told myself I was kind of done with documentaries for a while. And then I jumped straight into like this board gaming hobby where, you know, it just kind of marinated in my head and be, decided, became my next film. But uh, yeah, I mean, the world is just really fascinating and it's a, you know, artistic field and, you know, it's, it was very fun. So yes, it was very easy to just want to make a movie about this world. I gotta be honest with you guys. Uh, growing up, the only board game I played was chess. <laughs> I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't even play checkers. So the, this documentary really fascinates me, especially that one games designer who said that he, he reaches $10,000 goal in like seven minutes or so. I mean, I was like, man, I'm in the wrong business. I should be a game designer. So I guess my next question is, help me understand as an outsider here, um, I mean, I've seen video game obsession. I've seen movies obsession, that's me. Um, but tabletop obsession, what are the appeals? What are the attract uh, attractions? Charles, you want to answer that? Yeah, do I want to answer it? Well, you know, <laughs> it's it's a slow it's a slow rollout of things. You know, it's it's it's. I think it's about having a shared experience, having fun in a way that you're not familiar with. You know, it's like you said, you're you're on the outside looking in. You you don't you don't know what it's like to really be to play a lot of games. Uh, but all you have to do is show up and see who wants to play because the community is very welcoming. And when you do, and when you have that kind of fun with other people and have the shared experience, it just grows and grows and grows and grows and doesn't start out, you know, you don't get addicted the next day, but you know, it, it's in a very short period of time, you're going to, you're going to see how the, the fun level gets bigger and bigger and how your, your, enjoyment level gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, I, I think it begins with the people you play with. I mean, for me, I think about my evolution from playing online gaming. Like I used to be a hardcore Call of Duty guy. I used to play a lot of first yeah. person shooters. And when I moved to LA, you know, I would say around 2010, all the online experience for those games were, were becoming very toxic, at least for me. It's just like, 
you know, you jump into a game and while it's fun, it's just like, I would just mute everybody because I just didn't like the things that they're screaming about. And you start to just kind of like, well, you know, like I started to ask myself, what's the point of playing online multiplayer if I didn't even want to talk to anybody? If I didn't even want to like real, you know, you're just kind of playing with like these weird humanoid bots, right? So I think when I started my time in LA and I started getting into filmmaking, board games became this thing that kind of brought everybody together. And I think for people like me and Charles, you're, you're networking, you're, you're meeting people. And I think board games was just a great alternative to meeting new people, but you're kind of engaged into something else. And so when we started playing games heavily, I would say, what would you, what year was that Charles? Like 2013, 2014? I'm not really um, sure when it, when it, I like, mean, I'd say 14, 15, that seems about right. Yeah. yeah, you know, and it's it definitely started off solely like we just enjoyed playing together. And then after a while, you kind of want to get better in that game. And so does everybody else. So this competitive layer emerges and, and then you want to open it up to different experiences, but very similar. So we started seeking out games very similar to Catan, but not Catan mm. until it, just the variety of games exploded. And we we're just like experiencing all these different things. Yeah, you know, you're going through all these different levels, right? And so once we reached a plateau of our enjoyment, we started to try to find other things like conventions. And conventions is really what blew it up for us because then it was playing with people outside of us, introducing more people into our group, joining other people's group. I mean, it, it was pretty crazy. I mean, over the years of making Game Master, we turned our whole entire network of people into board gamers. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. So... Uh... I guess this is for Charles. So of all the game designers out there, um, how did you narrow down the list to featuring the people that you feature on this docu, like Nashra, Bruno, Charlie, and all these guys? How did you come down to selecting them? So there's, there's two answers to this question. You know, you have to separate the, the four people that we follow that are beginners. Um, that would be Charlie, Scott, Nashra, and Jason from the people who have been working in the industry for a while. Because, you know, before even talking to the people who had, you know, two, three, four, 20 games out, it was clear whether or not we want to talk to them and what we would want to talk to them about. You know, these are people who have made a career of it. This is their only job. And if they, you know, some of them are teachers, but that's because they, they still want to do teaching on the side. So it was, you know, that was a lot more clear of this person is going to have this to say, this person can talk about this subject, this person won game of the year award, you know, and this person sold a million copies, those subjects are clear. As far as finding people who were unknowns, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta be where the people are and you gotta ask them the questions about what they're doing. You know, you just go and you start talking to everybody and the people who have interesting stories, who have something to say, who are really making something of themselves, uh, those people stand out pretty quickly. Every artist knows that when you worked on an album or worked on a, you know, a movie or a script, um, and when you put the final product out there into the universe, it's pretty much out of your hands. Like you can't control the outcome or how that product will be received. Sometimes it can be a hit, sometimes it could be a flop. So um, when it comes to game designing, like uh, uh, what are the probabilities or the likeliness of success for newly launched games out there? Is it like six out of 10, four out of 10? Because I'd imagine that there will be uh, uh, cases when you'd have to go back to the drawing board, right? Absolutely. Well, I mean, success is relative. You mm -hmm. know, if you're expecting to sell, you know, 5,000 copies and you sell 8,000 copies, that is a success. If you're expecting to sell 25,000 copies and you sell 8,000 copies, not really a success. So, you know, it's all about expectations and a sliding scale of how big are you? You know, what is, what do you expect? How many copies did you actually make? What does your publisher expect if you have one? You know, uh, it's all relative. And, uh, you know, what is what is the success and or how many times do board game designers have to go back to the drawing board? Probably almost every time, you know, because yeah, many if, times if you, if you fail, then, oh, you got to you got to try harder. You got to try something to find something that works. If you succeed, you got to figure out what your next thing's going to be. Oh, I, I was just saying, you know, playtesting is like a huge part of it. 
you know, in, in the same way that if you're a chef and you make some food, you can tell if people really like it, the way they experience it, the way they eat it, how, how quick, how fast, you know? And so when you watch people play prototypes, I mean, you could see the joy in their faces. And if people immediately want to play it again when it's done, I mean, you get a good sense of how good it is. And then after that, it's just kind of refining it. But I think when people come up with an idea and they put it in front of like other people, like their friends or strangers. I mean, you start to get a good idea of like, if this could be a thing or not, you know? And, and I say this, me attempting to try to make a game very early on and then having Charles and our other friends play it and it sucked. <laughs> yep. So, uh, you know, that, that definitely discouraged me, but I know um, I'll definitely try to make it a game again one day. Uh, have you both uh, ever thought of designing your own tabletop game? Oh, we talk about it all the time, I think. Like, I, I, we definitely have plans to do it. And nice. I have, like, a notebook of ideas. Wait, we do? So, <laughs> <laughs> I have a notebook of ideas, but we're definitely going to do it. Awesome. Well, you heard it here first along with me. I guess we're going to make a board game. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exclusive. <laughs> so um, how has the tabletop gaming industry been faring during this COVID pandemic? I, I'd assume that... Obviously, the conventions are not happening, and the conventions are usually, like you said earlier, the best place to meet people and, and advertise and sell your product if you're, you know, game designers. Um, but so with that out of the picture this year, what is in the place of that? Uh, the overabundance of time is what's in the place of that. Uh, you know, board game sales are through the roof right now Ooh, really? because, you know, uh, you probably have family members or a roommate or whatever and all of y'all are sitting around the house all day and oh. you know you you got nothing but time you know time has no meeting anymore it's all relative and more than ever so what do people do they've they've been buying and playing a lot of board games and how many times can you play how many times in a week can you play one before you're like let's just go get another one and you know that happens over and over again so the board game sales have been you know unlike I was talking to somebody in the industry and they said that it, it's, it's like it was like the late 80s again when everybody was just buying a ton of board games from you know, department stores. Yeah, people are coming up with really inventive ways how to play it uh, via Zoom. You know, there, there's a game called Disney's Villainous that's really fun. Cool. And uh, I bought it during quarantine because my friend Alex recommended it to me. So Alex told me and another friend to buy it. So like from him, two other people bought it and we've been playing it on Zoom. As long as we each had a copy, it was pretty easy to keep track of everything, you know? Uh, we were playing code names for a while uh, online and there was like an online component, you know? So a lot of these board games have app versions as well. So I just feel like I bought a ton of board games during this time, honestly. You know, I, I keep also, on telling myself. I also myself, bought a ton of board games during this time. <laughs> yeah, I, I told myself like, okay, I'm gonna learn these games and I'm really excited when this is all over to, to kind of introduce it to, to my friends, you know, when we could get together again. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think I'm buying board games at the same rate as I was before COVID. One of the main things that I like about this docu are the personal stories. Some of them are very inspiring and uh, very heartfelt. Um, I think uh, one of the things that you guys brought up with this uh, documentary is the entrepreneurial spirit of it. Um, so I guess for both of you, if you want to chime in here, uh, what are the themes that you want the audiences to take away from having watched uh, a Game Master? Well, and one is, you know, a board game being looked at as a, a piece of art, an extension of the artists, like... Uh, like a songwriter, a song from a songwriter, a novel from an author, you know, painting from a painter. It's kind of the same thing. It's it, like the really good ones I find is, is stems from something that comes from within the creator. And, you know, you can see them on the board and in the play. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing, uh, you know, it's, it's um, about creation. You know, it, it's about these people having an idea in their head and doing what it takes, stepping through the hurdles and the ups and downs of, of, of making something into a reality, you know, and, and regardless of what field you're in, there's, there's something relatable to just that process. Yeah, you know, I, I echo everything Charles said, you know, like this movie, you know, you don't have to like board games in order to enjoy this film because it is about passion and it is about a, a creative endeavor and just believing in your dreams. I mean, it really has all those tropes of just trying to, trying to do what you want if you love it enough, 
you know, and, and how to accomplish those dreams. And I would like to believe that people could watch Game Master and have a good idea of how to be a game designer afterwards. You know, I, I think Charles provided a great foundation for people to just learn from and then just go at it. I mean, there's no, there's no real path to, to getting a board game made. I, I, you know, everybody's still trying to figure it out. Sure, there's like a corporate version where you like make it and you go to pitch at conventions and stuff. But I mean, with things like crowdfunding, like people are doing it all the time every day and figuring out really creative ways how to self-publish. You know, I mean, Game Master is like four different ways people did it. So, um, you know, and there's probably, you know, uh, dozens more. So I, I, I want people to, to watch the film be you know, emotionally connected to the designers and feel they could create something themselves, no matter how daunting it is. Once this pandemic blows over, what's next on your horizon? Is there the next uh, uh, documentary collaboration that you guys have in plan? We're, we're going to get together in the same room and play a board game. This was <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, may maybe, maybe we'll do a documentary. I don't know. I pitched Charles a couple of docs during this time. And they're all dumb. They're all dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like mostly, mostly my, my doc ideas come from like whatever I'm currently obsessed with right now. So eventually I'm going to pitch Charles a, a mechanical keyboard documentary because that's what I'm currently into. So who knows? <laughs> uh, well, uh, whatever it is, I'll be watching it, of course. And um, so for my fans at home, everybody go watch Game Master. Uh, which is available uh, uh, for free streaming for Amazon Prime members and also on VOD. Charles and Jimmy, thank you so much for talking to me and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.